the week. I'm Jar O'Brien. Joining me this week are Andy Parsons, Ed Byrne, Mickey Flanagan, Chris Addison, Hugh Dennis and Diane Morgan. <laughs> we start with a round called Headliners. Here's a picture of Labour leader Ed Miliband and his brother in happier times. But what does EMIT stand for? Is it evil mannequins <laughs> in Top Man? <laughs> Does it describe Ed's first year in office? Is it elected, married, isolated, terminated? <laughs> is, it, is it just what Ed's brain tells him to do when he's talking? Emit, emit, emit. <laughs> it's not simply easy, mate, I'm ticklish. <laughs> Is it more street than that, Dar? Is he saying to easy man, eyes tasty? <laughs> <laughs> is it just Ed Miliband is a tosser? Applauding <laughs> <laughs> the sentiment or the hard hitting nature? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or applauding <laughs> the existence of a publication in Britain that would run the headline, Ed Miliband is tosser. <laughs> We're the paper that tells it like it is. <laughs> is it Ed my injure troublemaker? How, How about know that? Engineers manufacture imitation Tories. Huh? Oh, huh? Yeah. That's that satire. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Feel the satire. Ah, yeah. Yeah. What's wrong, Britain? Too much truth for you? <laughs> <laughs> Equally satirically, is it Ed Miliband is tip leader? <laughs> Please. We're doing callbacks to last week's show now, are we? <laughs> Put away your crowbar uh, for one minute. Your time travelling <laughs> crowbar of comedy. Wait, uh, Ed Miliband in trouble. Ed Miliband in trouble. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, yes, I was looking for was Ed Miliband in trouble. This is the news that nine months into the job, Labour leader Ed Miliband is struggling for support within his party and for Labour voters, and there's been fresh scrutiny of his relationship with his brother. His brother's come out to defend him now, hasn't he? Yes. Because apparently their relationships are a bit frosty at the moment, but you're thinking, not as frosty as the Giggs brothers at the moment. <laughs> At least Ed Miliband can defend himself by going, well, I've only shagged your career, I never touched you off. <laughs> that Ed Miliband has demanded that David Miliband <laughs> is permanently out of focus in photographs. Yeah. <laughs> the male, are, particularly, the male are trying to, you know, they're trying to make more of this sibling rivalry thing, which David has denied by saying that it's a soap opera of which I want no part and the public have no interest. And then Ed went, <laughs> and then David said, hey, I don't sound like that. And then he said, no, you don't sound like that. <laughs> they didn't really help themselves. No, 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 you're right. Don't yeah. you think it's time for the mum to step in now and sort this out, really, to say, look, you can both be prime minister, but you've got to share. <laughs> I was talking to a friend and I was saying, I wonder what Ed Miliband is actually like. And they said, you've met him. And I thought, oh, I have. <laughs> that is what Ed Miliband is like. I had to be prompted to remember that I had met the man. <laughs> Ed, where? Where did I meet him? On the Andrew Marr show. Me, Andrew Marr and Ed Miliband, all dork. Could he have been hiding behind one of Andrew Marr's ears? <laughs> you, can't, you can't do that because they use those for the live feeds. <laughs> You have to point towards yeah, different territories yeah, just to bring yeah. in this. As the satellites move, so does Mars' head. Uh, <laughs> so if you, if you're surprised, <laughs> the signal goes in Asia. <laughs> what uh, did David Miliband never have the opportunity to do? He never had the opportunity to give a victory speech. He did. His victory speech that he prepared for the Labour leadership election was leaked this week, and it was disappointingly gracious. I felt once, just once, I would like to see an election where somebody gives a speech where they go, boom, I've done it, I'm being, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> but also in 
was, it was, if you're going to essentially have the opportunity to rewrite history, if you're going to leak a speech, then stick in a few things that make you look nine months later like, you know, just I believe in a society where any woman from Newcastle could go to America and get a job on a talent show and not be sent back. <laughs> just weird to they go, how did he know? How did he know that was going to happen? <laughs> and where did he deliver the speech? He delivered it to his wife in the car on the way home. That must have been an exciting <laughs> car. <card. laughs> At some point in the drive home, I'm assuming she went, David, excuse me, I've just got to deliberately set off the airbag. <laughs> <laughs> in other news, who has Ed Miliband attacked this week? The workshop. He has attacked the workshop. <laughs> yeah, which, yeah. you know, I think is a bit... He wants, his, he wants the workshop to go to work. Which well, I wants... think is a terrible <laughs> idea. I believe the workshop should stay on the dole where they belong. Where, the work, where they're a bit of a drain on the economy, fine. So long as they're not at work, that's when they cause problems. <laughs> As long as you're on the dole, they're not losing your luggage or derailing your trains. <laughs> as somebody who spent years signing on and working, I'm offended by that. <laughs> Can you really get the energy to be that offended? I used to like the 80s, because you used to go in... No-one cared in the 80s, did they? You just went into the unemployment benefit. There was all people walking about with buckets and ladders and overalls. Just No-one no one gave it. Just getting the ump because the woman was taking so long. Come on, love. We've all got to get back to work here. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Which coalition reforms are in the spotlight this uh, week? It's the NHS yes. reforms. Uh, this is the whole idea that uh, Cameron had said that basically there's a lot of waste in the NHS. And you're thinking, well, it's a massive organisation. You know, within that organisation, there's going to be a lot of people, presumably, sat around on their bum doing very little. But let's face it, a lot of them are very ill. <laughs> <laughs> What for me was when Cameron said uh, he wanted to rid the NHS of imbalances. I thought, how are people going to get to hospital? It wasn't strange. The, the, the plan was to hand control to the GPs, who only do a certain part of the work. Like, I mean, the GPs didn't want this because they knew, like, okay, you look after the NHS. They were going, I, I don't know how the big machines work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, just, I just send the people to do the people who can do the big machine. Ah! <laughs> The whole idea of the GP consortium, though, is basically using it so as doctors not only have to decide what is the best treatment for you, but it's also whether that treatment might be value for money. So each time you go and see your GP, they'll be having a little argument with themselves as to what exactly they should be doing. It'd be like going to see Gollum, you know? <laughs> come in, come in, nice man. Oh, but he wants the precious! <laughs> but he's not very well, no! Let him die! Kill him! Kill him! The key thing they're trying to get rid of, though, is the cost, isn't it? It's the cost of the NHS, and you can do that with making no changes at all. All you've got to do, really, is get rid of the confidentiality of doctors. If you go to a GP and yeah. you know he's not going to be confidential, if he comes out and goes, hey, you see Mr Smith, he's got piles the size of onions, <laughs> you're never going to go to the doctor again. <laughs> whole system will pay for itself. I, I, I don't think you've been watching embarrassing illnesses. Uh, <laughs> people are very happy to show off oh, their yeah. weirdnesses. <laughs> if they could do it in the waiting room, look at that, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> you've seen one of them before, it shouldn't be there, it should be here. I don't know what's in there. <laughs> look at that, I'm not serious, look at that. Ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. That shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> uh, in other news, what is going on here? Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, it's Boris Johnson saying, bloody hell, who called the Child Support Agency? <laughs> Boris finally comes in useful as a battering ram. <laughs> <laughs> Is he saying, uh, uh, to be honest, I thought the Olympic Village would be a bit smarter than this. <laughs> He does look like he's saying, oh, I will not have people keeping these bikes out longer than they've paid for. <laughs> <laughs> looks like a new crap crime drama, doesn't it? Tough cop. <laughs> he does look like he's just at a party going, Is, is the toilet this way? <laughs> There's a policeman saying, look, it's a fat one from Little Britain. <laughs> you know the drugs are good when you think that the Mayor of London has just come into your flat. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, what I like back to is the police are clearly going in one direction, into the flat, while Boris is discreetly coming out of the flat. <laughs> well done, well done, keep it up, keep it up there. <laughs> he's, in, he's in there. He's in there. Get him, get him, quick, get him. <laughs> 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 I don't understand. He's got this, this white cross on a green background on the policeman's helmet. Is. It looks like one of those things, if you squeeze his head, Play-Doh's going to come out of that. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, the, the guy who is called Rambo, age 48, and uh, when he saw <laughs> Boris Johnson, said the words, what the fuck are you doing here? 
<laughs> Which is a fair point, not yeah. to the police. Like, oh, huh, coppers. But, but yeah. <laughs> He's the last person you should take on a raid, because the, <laughs> the idea of a, a raid is a secrecy, right? But he just constantly chunters, bum, 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 bum. He's <laughs> waiting outside the door, could you just be quiet, bum, 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 bum. The element of surprise is incredibly important, so bum, 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 bum. He's, he's like a posh motorbike, bum, 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 yeah, it doesn't, because it doesn't, just doesn't work the whole, you know, like you see American crime movies where the guy, the police chief's got, I got the mayor on my back of that disc, but I was seeing, and behind him is Bart going, flubbity, flubbity, flub, flub, flub. Whiff, 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 flub, whiff, 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 I think what the fuck are you doing here is a perfectly reasonable response to Boris Johnson turning up during a raid on your house. I think it was a perfectly reasonable response for people who worked in the mayor's office when he first turned up for work. Called The Apprentice, You're Funny. This game <laughs> involves Mickey, Diane, and Chris. If you could make your way to the performance area, please. This round is a stand up challenge. I launched a wheel of news, and whoever it chooses to stop, one of our performers must step forward and talk about that subject. The winner is whoever I think is the funniest. Okay, here we go. The first subject is. School. Who wants to come in on that? Diane. Uh, a lot of my um, a lot of my friends are starting to have kids now, and uh, it always amazes me the amount of effort that some parents put into choosing a school for their kids. Because when I was younger, my parents were like, George Tomlinson's is a bit far away, isn't it? <laughs> She'll only have to cross one road if she goes to St Peter's. That's settled then, St Peter's. <laughs> is. Yeah, they've got in high teenage pregnancies, but she probably won't get knocked over. <laughs> et momentum mori etway. That was the Latin that was over the door at my school. It means knocked up, but not knocked down. <laughs> it's a rubbish school, my school, though. It's really rubbish. My domestic science class was about 45 minutes long, right? So they didn't have time to show us how to prepare and cook an apple pie from scratch. Right? So to save time, to cut corners, they said, bring in some ready-made pastry and a tin of apples. <laughs> ready-made, ready-made, all ready-made pastry and a tin of apples. I don't know why they didn't just have a class on how to buy an apple pie. Thank you very much. OK, let's spin the wheel again. The subject is technology. Chris. We really take technology for granted now. We live in an age of miracles, right? Not that you would know this, not that you would know this, because we take everything, everything just as it's owed to us. Wireless. You've got wireless, right? In your house? Yes? Yeah. Some of the older people go, of course I've got a bloody wireless. How do you think I listen to the archers? <laughs> Keep it on permanently in case they declare war. I'm not getting caught out twice. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I don't, mean, I, I don't mean wireless, I mean Wi-Fi, right? Wireless... Wireless, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you first saw wireless, wireless, you thought, look, look at that, look! Look, that is the science fiction of my childhood available to me now in my adult years. Thank you! Thank you, O oh, providential universe! To be alive at a time such as this is a privilege! And now, within half an hour, you're going, WORK, YOU BASTARD! <laughs> is the time between miracle and basic human right. As, uh, as we can say, we're pathetic. You can be sat in your front room watching Hole in the Wall, right, with your laptop there. Every piece of information you could possibly want in the universe is available to be beamed through the dust of your sitting room to right in front of your chops. That is a bona fide miracle. It goes down for 40 seconds and we go, oh, my God! <laughs> this is like living in a third world country. <laughs> I was dead. Well done, Chris. Thank you very much. That leaves us with Mickey. Let's see what you've been left with. And the topic is fashion. <laughs> OK, Mickey. Bound to be, wasn't it? <laughs> I've returned to the vest. Um, happened a couple of years ago. I was walking through Marx's to get me pants. You always go back to Marx's. And, uh, <laughs> they know. They look at you. They go, you come back. And you, come back. <laughs> you went the next day and you got flash. <laughs> and uh, I saw the vest. <laughs> I saw the vest. Packet of singlet vests. I thought, I'm having them. <laughs> Put 
them in my basket, I covered them over like pornography. <laughs> got to the can, I said to the woman, get them in the bag, love, get them in the bag. <laughs> got home, I shook one of these vests out, I thought, put it on, I thought, that is the answer. <laughs> the wife came home, she said, what's all this with the vest? I said, I like them, I'm, I'm returned to the vest. She said, I don't mind, but only indoors. <laughs> so for a couple of years, I've worn the vest, sort of in secret. <laughs> But the other day, I'd had a couple of cans of beer and I wanted a couple more, so I got up to go out and my wife said, the, 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 the vest. I said, no more. <laughs> I refuse to live a lie. <laughs> I'm standing up for vest wearers all over the world. <laughs> now, Mark off down the office. I've got two cans of Stella Arturis. <laughs> Put one in my back pocket, crack the other one open. And I walked back from the office in my vest. <laughs> I made a discovery. You drink a can of Stella and wear a vest, you get a bit of space. <laughs> well done there. Thanks for Lee <laughs> Our next round is called If This Is The Answer, What Is The Question? On the board are six categories. Diane, which category would you like? Uh, America. OK, your category is America. The answer is around 24,000. What is the question? Is it how many pictures of Pippa Middleton's arse were in the news of the world today? <laughs> is it how many people have to be in a post office before they open a second cashier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it how many perfectly normal children's names are there that Gwyneth Paltrow seems to be completely unaware of? <laughs> Monkeys were shaved to provide <laughs> Rooney's hair dryer. <laughs> Is it as, a, as, a, as a bald man, you can't even say the word <laughs> hair dryer. It's, 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 it's a betrayal of you <laughs> and everything you stand for. <laughs> Is it the number of Father's Day cards Ryan Giggs is going to receive this? <laughs> <laughs> Is it how many salads can you buy for the price of one in Berlin Aldi? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it what uh, ticket number would make you think, do you know, I think I might come back to this deli counter tomorrow? <laughs> um, is it how many missed calls Simon Cowell has from Cheryl Cole? <laughs> Olympic tickets did you have to apply for to get Rose Z for the synchronised swimming? <laughs> How it... many times could I punch Piers Morgan in the face before it stopped being fun and I continued to do it out of a sense of duty? <laughs> <laughs> Is it the number of times I say what a lot of old bollocks when my wife is watching Likewise the Candle? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and do you want a clue? It's about yeah. Alaska. Is it how many emails have, or how many pages of emails have they released from Sarah Palin? Uh, that's a very good. Thank you very much, Ed Byrne. <laughs> yes, the question I was looking for was approximately how many pages of Sarah Palin's emails were released in Alaska this week. This is the news that 24,199 pages of emails have been released by the Alaska Governor's Office under freedom of information laws. The emails date from 2006 when Palin was the state's first female governor to 2008 when John McCain named her as his running mate for the White House. What did they reveal? Well, quite a lot of them said, do you want to buy a Kindle for Father's Day? <laughs> 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 They're quite boring, actually. Yes. There's, there are the emails about her frustration with journalists who keep asking her whether she believes that dinosaurs coexisted with people. And all she really needs to do is show them a picture of herself standing next to John McCain and go, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what these emails reveal is that she's got very little grasp of history. And you're thinking, Sarah Palin would not work in this country, would you? Basically, the rednecks seem to like her because she's quite fit with no grasp of what happened in the past. It would be like us electing, as you know, the next Prime Minister, Kelly Brook, and forgiving her <laughs> when she said the reason that Churchill was the greatest ever Britain was because he provided this country with cheap car insurance. <laughs> Are you paying too much for your car insurance? <laughs> 
the, the, uh, it's interesting. She's unbelievably dull in, in her private utterances. Like, this is the stuff that we, you know, they had to fight to get. And they're really dull, right? As opposed to what she publicly does, like, for example, sitting on a couch covered in a dead bear, right? <laughs> this is stuff she does willingly, right? The only thing she hides is the really boring thing. She's only thing. got the bear there to keep the crab away. <laughs> <laughs> She hasn't noticed that crab. Nature in balance. Yeah. The bear and the crab, natural predators to each other, <laughs> just <laughs> circling each other constantly. Yeah. The two of them trapped in this Well, I was going to say, she seems to have a secret cloud base. <laughs> <laughs> that looks like the start of one of the, um, the weirdest porn movies you're ever going to watch in your life. <laughs> Isn't that a lot, though? 24,000. This is in 21 months, so that's just over 1,000 a month, which is just over 50 a day, which is about six an hour, isn't it? Welcome to Matthew Hughes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's sending six quite big emails every hour. Is that a lot? Where did she, how did she find time to govern anything? The no. last kid, the bears do most of it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why they, that's why they have to arm them. There's the right yeah. to arm bears in Alaska. <laughs> in other news, how have exam boards let down students this week? Poor students. By asking questions that are unanswerable. In what manner yeah. were they unanswerable? They didn't have enough information in them. The papers, there were typos or mistakes on the paper. Yeah. Yes. One, one of the sports science papers was a really tough one. It said, <laughs> uh, name. <laughs> <laughs> Again, they're saying these are impossible. This is an impossible maths exam. Rubbish. You only know a maths exam is impossible when you hear a voice at the back going, this is bullshit, I'm leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Smashing into the other table, <laughs> bang, bang, trying to reverse yeah. around, bang, <laughs> uh, bang, <laughs> bang. Uh, the best exam story ever was a, there was a there were teachers giving out to us for doing because uh, it's very boring to be a, a, to invigilate exams and they had games that they devised. Uh, it was, was who's the ugliest student uh, and the two of them one of them would walk down and stand next to who they thought was the ugliest <laughs> student. <laughs> and then would walk back up again and the other would go. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> they would walk down to they thought was the ugliest student and they go, mm. yeah. favourite exam story was possibly an apocryphal one of somebody coming out of a biology exam and complaining bitterly that they had thrown in a physics question because this, and this guy even saying, like, because I, I know about charged particles, I know what a cat ion is, I know what an an ion is, but I've never heard of an on ion. But that was an onion. <laughs> 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 there was a, uh, we did exam once in, in college and there was a, it was shared, there was, there was, there was loads, you know these big halls with loads, loads of different classes are in and one girl had just a conniption fit because it just went wrong. Just, this is awful. And she started crying at the table really loudly and they had to get her out. Because, like, it's only an hour into the three-hour exams and people are like, Come on, this, is like this is tough enough as it is without this going on. So they took her out and they put her just outside the door, right? And then every time somebody went to the toilet, you'd hear... <laughs> The person's going to come back from the toilet in a minute, and you're all going, I don't, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> was, was that because the invigilator was standing outside the door next to her going, this one! <laughs> this one! <laughs> OK, at the end of that round, the point's going to Chris, you and Diane! OK, now we come to scenes we'd like to see. So if everyone can make their way oh, over yeah. to the performance area, I'll read out this week's topics, and then we'll see what our panellists can come up with. OK, here we go. The first subject is unlikely things to hear on a history documentary. The Russians had Lemsip. The Americans had Night Nurse. This was the Cold War. <laughs> and it was in this humble florist that the War of the Roses began. <laughs> Guy Fawkes' bid to blow up the Houses of Parliament failed when he realised his body was made of jumpers and his head was an old football. <laughs> Tonight on Bruce Forsyth's History of Britain, Bo de Seer, de Seer Bo! <laughs> <laughs> Horatio Nelson, one arm, one eye. A tragic example of what can happen if you fall asleep and someone finds your organ donor card. <laughs> Welcome to Biggest Historical Boobs with me, Katie Price. <laughs> 
Tonight, I intend to find out exactly what did happen to Hitler's other ball. And my search <laughs> begins right here in the Albert Hall. <laughs> And on Time Team tonight, we're in Stratford on Avon, where we've uncovered loads of monkey skeletons and some typewriters. <laughs> when Hitler started writing Mein Kampf, he intended it to be a light hearted romp called Carry On Kampfing. <laughs> John F. Kennedy, Indira Gandhi, John Lennon, if history teaches us anything, it's that if you don't want your child assassinated, don't name them after an airport. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not interested in all this old nonsense, really, but um, <laughs> since the end of Blackadder, the work's been fairly hard to come by. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe that this crumbling old ruin presented Weakest Link for as long as she did. <laughs> Of course, the Bronze Age was the third best age in history. <laughs> and now the documentary that every Channel 5 commissioner has dreamt of. Did Hitler sink the Titanic? <laughs> we've been digging in this field in Hampshire for three weeks and we've found this one piece of crockery which tells us we desperately need to get laid. <laughs> OK, the next topic is... On likely things to hear over a tannoy. We apologise to customers who have recently alighted at Northampton. I opened the wrong doors. <laughs> Could all the people shopping here at Hasda please accept that you are piss poor? <laughs> <laughs> Clean up required in the magazine aisle between <laughs> loaded and nuts. <laughs> Would the parents of the lost child please pick him up from the meeting point? Madonna is trying to buy him. <laughs> I'd like to remind customers that our special offer this week is 100% off German bean sprouts. <laughs> if you would like to upgrade to first class, then you should have worked harder at school and got a better job. <laughs> Could the small boy holding the owl stop running at the wall between platforms 9 and 10? <laughs> Will the man on pump number four please remove the nozzle from the backside of the man on pump number six? <laughs> Could the owner of the Ford Fiesta 1100 in the car park with the tinted windows and the go faster stripes sort your life out, mate? <laughs> What the code is. Uh, uh, what, what, um, would, would Mr. Fire please report? <laughs> please report to the kitchen. That's Mr. Out of Control Fire. Please report to the kitchen before it's too late. I don't want to start a panic. <laughs> the train now approaching platforms three, four, and five is the derailed <laughs> train from Swansea. <laughs> Would the owners of a black Jaguar please move it as it's attacking the customers? <laughs> this is your captain speaking. You can now turn on your mobile phones as you'll need to text your loved ones goodbye <laughs> as we plummet into the sea. Show. This week's winners are Chris Addison, Hugh Dennis, and Diane Morgan. <laughs> Commiserations to Andy Parsons, Ed Byrne, and Mickey Flanagan. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'm Dara Green. Good night. <laughs> Dora O'Brien explores the Adriatic this Tuesday at 9 in the company of Griff Rhys-Jones and Rory McGrath. 
So that'll be far from quiet sailing then in Three Men Go to Venice. And drama next tonight here on BBC Two in the thrilling conclusion to The Shadow Line.